Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this Columbia Business School Executive Education Webinar. My name is Matthew Monagle. I'm the Web Manager here at Executive Education, and we're joined by our special guest, Frank Rose, who'll be talking about the science of story. Now, a few housekeeping notes before we start. Uh, if you have any questions that come to mind while the presentation is going on, please feel free to leave them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or at the bottom of your screen on your phone as well. We will be taking questions for about five to 10 minutes at the very end, so feel free to leave them as they come to mind and we'll address them when we can. Uh, also, at the end of this, within about two to three business days, we'll make sure that you have a full recording as well as a uh, visual presentation of the slides that have been covered today. Uh, so keep an eye out for that email. Now today, it's my privilege to introduce Frank Rose. Frank began his career as a journalist, writing for publications such as Fortune, Strategy and Business, The New York Times, and Wired Magazine. His work at the intersection of media and technology led to his most recent book, The Art of Immersion, How the Digital Generation is Remaking Hollywood, Madison Avenue, and the Way We Tell Stories. In addition to his work as a writer and a speaker, Frank also runs the Digital Storytelling Lab at Columbia University School of the Arts, and is the faculty director for our upcoming Digital Storytelling Strategy Program on April 21st. Frank, welcome. Thank you, Matthew, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, very glad to be here. I want to, uh, as Matt said, I want to talk a bit about the science of story, and what we're going to cover today is a couple of key things. First off, why do we tell stories? Why are stories so important? How do stories work? How do they actually work in the brain? And why do we want to immerse ourselves in story? This is sort of a universal uh, human uh, desire, and it has been something that we have done all throughout history, uh, regardless of the technology that's involved, whether they're books or virtual reality. So we're going to be looking at all of these, and uh, in particular, we're going to be looking at them from a uh, sort of a marketing point of view, because I think that's a, a really critical issue here. Now, I want to start off with a little video. It's a silent video. This is actually a film that was made in 1944 by Fritz Heider and Marianne Simmel, who were uh, two uh, quite noted researchers. And they were looking at, uh, you know, wh why, why and how do we interpret things as stories? What we're uh, looking at here is a, uh, you know, sort of a, a, obviously some geometrical shapes that are interacting with one another in some fashion. There's two triangles, a, a round dot and a rectangle that's open at one side. And when they ran this experiment with a group of uh, students at, uh, I believe it was Smith College in Massachusetts in 1944, there was actually only one student who described it in those terms. All the other students described it as, uh, you know, some variation on, well, uh, you know, there's a there's a, a woman and there's a uh, a gentleman and there's a big bully of a man who is the uh, the large triangle and he's trying to corner the woman and they uh, managed to lock him in and escape and uh, then as things go on uh, you know th there's a there's a denouement eventually he gets frustrated the the bully gets frustrated and uh, tears the place apart so I think what what this um, what this suggests is that story is such an inherent uh, uh, thing for us that we are going to see stories anywhere. And um, um, so you might ask why this is. One of my favorite authors is Brian Boyd, who is a um, uh, uh, he teaches English at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, and he is the, uh, you know, sort of leading um, uh, authority on Nabokov. But a few years back in 2010, I believe, he wrote a really remarkable book called On the Origin of Stories. This is a uh, essentially a literary Darwinist approach to uh, to literature, to uh, in fact the genesis and the purpose of narrative, and 
his point is that um, fiction uh, and, by extension, stories in general, serve a function by they train us to quickly understand real-life social situations, uh, to make inferences, to see situations from other people's point of view. And not only that, they encourage us to do this not just once, but over and over. Uh, you know, this is really key, as he says in this passage, um, fiction entices us again and again to immerse ourselves in story, um, helping us to rehearse and refine our understanding of events. Uh, that's, uh, among other things, why little kids might want to see the same, hear the same story or see the same movie over and over again. Uh, but the point is that stories contain lessons, and by immersing ourselves, we learn those lessons more effectively, just as we l would learn a foreign language more effectively by immersing ourselves in that. Um, and the implication, uh, clearly, is that storytelling and immersion are fundamentally adaptive responses. Now, I'm going to tell a little story now about a uh, researcher in Kansas in the uh, early uh, uh, 1950s, late 40s, early 50s. Um, his name is Roger Barker. Uh, he's a pretty well-known uh, psychologist. He was the chair of the psychology department at the University of uh, Kansas at the time. And he lived in a very small town, which you see here, the main intersection, um, uh, that had a population of about 750 on a really good day. The town is Oskaloosa, uh, Kansas. And uh, in 1949, uh, he ran a uh, an experiment uh, about a seven-year-old schoolboy named Raymond. Now, at the time, psychology was dominated by people like B.F. Skinner, people conducting lab experiments. Uh, Barker thought all that was nonsense. He, uh, you know, wanted to do what Jane Goodall would do later with chimpanzees in Tanzania, which is to study Homo sapiens, uh, study his own species in its natural habitat. So he set up this uh, Midwestern psychological field station, as he called it, which is on the second floor of this bank building in the center of town. And the study that he did was a minute-by-minute -minute account of uh, what Raymond did, Raymond, the seven-year-old schoolboy, during a 14-hour day in 1949. This was published as uh, One Boy's Day, a specimen record of behavior. Now, uh, sometime later, about 60 years later, in fact, um, psychologists at Washington University in St. Louis uh, decided to make Barker's book the focus of, um, somewhat ironically, an experiment. And uh, it was a neuroimaging experiment that was designed to help us understand how we handle stories. So they, uh, you know, as in a situation very similar to what you see here. Uh, they ran people into an MRI machine. Uh, they had a uh, apparatus above the person's head so that they could project uh, the story and the person could read it. And uh, then they would watch what happened in the brain as the person was reading the story. What they found was quite remarkable. What they found was that um, Every time Raymond picked up his workbook, for example, the people in the MRI machine experienced brain activity in regions that were associated with grasping motions. Uh, when he shook his head no, they experienced brain activity in the part of the brain that's believed to uh, deal with goal-directed activity. And when he walked up to his teacher's desk, their brains lit up in areas that are thought to deal with uh, location in space. Now, the conclusion that the researchers uh, came to in this uh, um, article that was published in uh, Psychological Science um, was that uh, these, these results support the view that people understand the story by stimulating, I'm sorry, by simulating the events in the story world. Uh, in other words, we understand stories by simulation. Uh, 
And uh, what you see here, by the way, this is downtown Oskaloosa, Kansas today. It hasn't changed very much except that the uh, psychological field station uh, has been all boarded up. But this idea that uh, we um, uh, experience stories as a simulation, uh, that they're a rehearsal, is a very powerful idea. And it goes... Uh, uh, far to explaining our understanding of stories today. Uh, you know, if you think about it, sometimes we, we do this, um, we consider stories as a rehearsal for life uh, explicitly in, in fairy tales, for example. Uh, you know, we're told not to go into the woods alone, not to talk to strangers. Um, sometimes uh, implicitly, which is the way it is with most fiction. You know, Jane Austen is a rehearsal for young women in 19th century, early 19th century England. The Walking Dead, if you think about it, is a rehearsal for the zombie apocalypse. Now, this is not how we usually think about stories. Uh, uh, historically, Henry James, in a famous paper in 1884, described stories as an impression of life. Um, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson replied to him by saying, no, that's not the case at all, that life is monstrous, infinite, illogical, and abrupt, whereas a work of art is neat, finite, self-contained, rational, and flowing. Uh, art, in other words, is artifice. We use it to model reality. And in that sense, stories are actually somewhat like games. Now, uh, about 10 years ago, the cognitive psychologists uh, Raymond Marr and Keith Oatley in Toronto wrote a landmark paper uh, called The Function of Fiction is the Abstraction and Simulation of Social Experience. Their point was that like computer simulations, stories model and abstract the human social world. They're far from simply a retelling of events. Uh, they are... Uh, they communicate complex social information, they offer personal enactments of experience, and because they are abstractions, they demand that readers project themselves into the story. This makes sense. If you think about it, it's, it explains, for example, why we get scared in horror movies. Immersion uh, is simply an extreme form of that projection. Now, it turns out that immersion has, a, has an interesting side effect. Uh, some years ago, in uh, the, the late 90s, Melanie Green, who is now a social psychologist at State University of New York in Buffalo and was then a grad student at Ohio State, ran some experiments to determine uh, how or even whether stories affect people's feelings and opinions about the real world. In order to do this, she had them read a story about a very vivid account of a little girl being randomly stabbed to death in a mental patient. The story was called Murder at the Mall, and it was adapted from a chapter in Sherwin Newland's book, How We Die. Uh, we are used to thinking of, um, of, of shopping malls as these sort of very anodyne experiences, but sometimes reality intrudes, and that's what happens. What happened uh, in this case. Now, for the purposes of the experiment, um, some participants were told that it was true, others were told that it was fictional. Uh, and after it was over, they were asked um, whether psychiatric patients should be allowed in the community. Uh, other questions such as, uh, how likely is violence to occur in public places? Do we live in a fundamentally just world? And the goal of the experiment was to find out were the people who were more deeply immersed in the story and others react differently to it. Uh, than the people who were less deeply immersed. First, of course, they had to figure out which readers were immersed. That was not an easy task, but what uh, Green and Timothy Brock, her co-author on the, uh, uh, in, on the uh, study, uh, did was they developed a quote-unquote transportation scale. Transportation being the uh, sort of uh, psychology word for uh, the academic word for immersion. And uh, they 
created um, 15 statements uh, that people could ident- could um, you know, agree with or not. Uh, things like, I wanted to learn how the narrative ended, or um, while reading the narrative, I had a vivid image of a particular scene or a particular character. And then the people would be asked to rank their responses on a seven-point scale from not at all to very much. Now, uh, what they found was that um, uh, emotional involvement was a key factor, and it uh, really helped determine um, how readily people would project themselves into the story. The more they were transported by the story, the more likely they were to uh, express opinions that were consistent with it, such as the idea that mental patients should not be let out unsupervised. Um, and also, the less likely they were to find fault with the story's point of view. Um, and interestingly, whether the story was, uh, to- whether they were told the story was fact or fiction made very little difference. Now, subsequent research has, uh, has produced very similar results. Uh, in another study about 10 years later, um, also at Ohio State, uh, it was discovered that people tend to spontaneously assume the identity of the main character in a story. And the more likely they do so, the more likely they are to change their attitudes and behavior afterwards. But it was discovered Furthermore, that they were more inclined to merge identities, so to speak, with someone who was like them rather than with someone who was different from them in some way. Uh, for example, if they, were, uh, if they read a story about a person who was black or gay, uh, they were less likely to, um, to identify with that person. They were uh, less likely to... Uh, merge identities with the character and to, uh, you know, have an immersive experience of the story. However, it was a different experience if they weren't told that the character was black or gay until very late in the story. Uh, If that happened, their attitudes uh, tended to be quite different. Um, if, if what what would happen is they would uh, tend to emerge after reading the story with a significantly more favorable attitude toward that group. The implication, I think, being that you know by then they had already identified with the character. It was sort of too late to pull back, um, and. So I think uh, what's happening here, well, a lot of other research has been done, and it has extended and enhanced our understanding of this phenomenon. Uh, For example, at Carnegie Mellon a few years back, uh, um, uh, it was um, demonstrated that if you tell a story about a victim and uh, you identify the victim, you tell certain details about what happened, people are much more likely to give money for, uh, you know, to, for relief than if uh, they're just given a statistical report. You know, this is, of course, something we've always known intuitively, but it's never actually been uh, uh, proven until now. So you might wonder, how does this happen? Um, Paul Zak, who's a neuroscientist at at Claremont in California, has conducted an ingenious uh, series of experiments uh, that involved the release, uh, his study of the release of the neurochemical oxytocin, which is identified with enhanced feelings of trust and empathy. He found a way to track the oxytocin levels in the blood in real time via an electrocardiogram, and also uh, at the same time measure heartbeat and perspiration, which indicate uh, our emotional arousal and the attention that we're devoting to something. And what this um, uh, did essentially was enable him to see how the brain and even how the body respond to character-driven narratives. Typically, what happens is that first we pay attention. First, our intention is engaged by the story. Then we become more or less immersed. We bond emotionally with the characters. 
And finally, when the oxytocin kicks in, um, we uh, develop feelings of trust and uh, empathy, and we're motivated to act in some way. Um, this uh, subsequent experiments have shown that this uh, uh, happens not just with uh, uh, charity, charitable situations, uh, but with brands, with uh, you know the the way that we identify the feelings that we have toward brands. Another uh, researcher in another paper wrote um, a few years back, given the implications of stories for the narrative persuasion of consumers, nothing is less innocent than a story. Now, if we, uh, if we go back to Brian Boyd for a moment, uh, I think this raises the question of where does that leave us? How should, uh, you know, how should marketers respond? How should the advertising industry respond? Um, and, you know, we, we live in a time increasingly, obviously, when people are very resistant to advertising, more and more resistant to it. Uh, you know, we, we see that in, uh, on television. Uh, with television, we see that online. The rise of ad blockers, uh, you know, is, is a clear indication that people are not comfortable with the, uh, you know, sort of quote unquote social bargain that they are uh, expected to sit still and watch advertising in exchange for getting free content. Um, I think what is happening here is that we are, you know, moving away from a time when uh, you can effectively sell people on something, uh, when you can give them a simple, you know, buy this message, uh, to a time when as a marketer, you have to offer them something more. You have to offer them something else. And uh, at the very least, what that something else has to consist of is, uh, is some form of entertainment, something to grab their attention, and that means a story. Uh, you know, it's quite clear from all of this research that uh, rhetorical uh, arguments are much less effective than storytelling. Um, Boyd uh, summarizes this, uh, uh, this situation with this comment here that, that uh, through competition, signals that uh, you know, evolve through competition are very costly. Um, messages have to become louder and longer and more and more repetitive, uh, as he says, like the roar of red deer stags or Super Bowl advertisers. Um, and what is happening clearly is that the more, uh, the, the, the more repetitive, the louder you get, the more resistant people become. Whereas, uh, as Boyd goes on to say, signals that are used for cooperative pur uh, purposes are uh, energetically cheap and informationally rich. I love that phrase, actually, energetically cheap and, uh, uh, and emotion informationally rich. Uh, that's how you disarm the filter. The conspiratorial whisper, as he puts it, whispers get passed along because one reason that we tell stories is to share them, to share information. Uh, as he writes elsewhere in the book, life is a constantly functioning information exchange. Uh, we share uh, information for profit. Uh, we share information to establish our status. Uh, and uh, most importantly of all, we share information to survive. So I think um, that's really what I wanted to communicate here. I hope it was, uh, I hope it's been helpful and I'm eager to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Frank. That was really great. Uh, we do have some questions, and feel free now is the time to ask some more in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. One person would just like to learn a little bit more. They wanted a reminder as to the name of the researcher that studied oxytocin, and 
also, if they're interested in that particular line of, you know, of psychological studies and things like that, where could they go to learn a little bit more about that particular study? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the name of the researcher is Paul J. Zak, Z-A-K. Um, he's at um, Claremont Graduate University in California. And the uh, one uh, paper that he wrote that uh, very neatly summarizes this is from the journal Marketing Management. Uh, it's called the Neuroscience of Brain Trust, and he uh, co-wrote it with um, uh, a, a, a um, fellow researcher at uh, Claremont, uh, Lawrence Crosby. Uh, that was published in May 2015, and uh, it's a, it's a, sort of a a um, a summary of his research, and I think that uh, there there are other papers that are you know go into much more detail, but that's a very good place to start. By the way, when we post this uh, uh, webinar online in a few days, I'll have another slide that you'll be able to see, which will list. Uh, a number of the, uh, you know, some of the main sources, uh, the the papers that I have uh, uh, been referring to here. So another question that we had, um, somebody was asking about storytelling as it differs in cultures. Um, different cultures emphasize different things. One might be more driven towards logic, while the other one does abstract thinking. Is storytelling as a whole universal across these, or does it change a little bit to, to match the culture it's in? I think that, uh, I mean, there are certainly ways in which it changes um, by culture, but in, uh, at the fundamental level, it's uh, really remarkably um, uh, coherent. It's, uh, you know, across, across all uh, different cultures. And uh, it's, um, you know, as with, as with language itself, I mean, you know, we have different words for things. We have uh, you know, figures of speech and terms that, you know, reflect a certain cultural bias. But the fundamental way in which stories work uh, and the fundamental nature of stories seems to be something that is, uh, is really universal. We had someone else ask about storytelling in businesses. Um, are there any cautions about its overuse? More and more businesses are becoming aware of the power of telling a story as a way of drawing customers. Is there kind of a, a point where you might reach diminishing returns or where customers might react unfavorably to being uh, made the center of these narratives? Uh, you know, I, that's a very interesting question. And I'm not aware of um, of of companies or brands that have used story too much if anything it's uh, quite the opposite but um there are obviously ways in which stories can be used effectively uh there are effective stories and there are less effective stories and less effective ways to use them and i i think one of the keys here is to understand the concept of the story world the story world is, uh, as the term suggests, the world in which the story takes place, whether it's a fictional story, a, a factual story, uh, or whatever. Um, the fact that we want to, uh, that, that we have this innate uh, tendency to uh, um, identify with the main character uh, or with another character, perhaps, uh, to identify with the person who, in the story who was most like us uh, and all of that. You know, the the fact that that happens suggests that people really want to project themselves in into the story. And in order to do that successfully, the storyteller has to leave some way uh, in which it's uh, uh, to, some way to make it easy to do that. And, you know, that can be as simple as, uh, you know, a, a really appealing main character, say. Um, it can be a, a, you know, sort of um, uh, tug on the emotions. Uh, the, uh, you know, Budweiser's uh, Super Bowl ads for the past uh, few years um, have really been, uh, you know, sort of male weepies involving dogs and horses. Uh, you know, it's it's quite remarkable. Um, Burberry has used storytelling very, very effectively, but also in a very subtle way. Uh, 
uh, you know, it's not that they tell elaborate stories. It's that they, uh, you know, all of their marketing, uh, you know, whether it's online, uh, their online store, their their real world stores, uh, all of these tell a coherent narrative that uh, that rein- reinforces the identity of the brand in subtle but important ways. Uh, for example, there's a great deal of emphasis on um, uh, you know handiwork on the fact that people you know who who work there have craftsmanship and that their products are a product of of craftsmanship so you know that means that uh, unlike many luxury brands many luxury brands are uh, you get the sense watching the ads for them that they're expensive because they're expensive with a burberry you get the sense that there's something real behind it something authentic and so there's a, a, a kind of you know despite the luxury aspect and despite the fact that the products are in fact very expensive there's a uh, there's a sense of grittiness to them uh, the, to to the to the advertising and to the uh, marketing messages which is quite fascinating and they uh, reinforce that that sense of craftsmanship by uh, on their website at Burberry.com, there's a uh, a page that's all about music, and you might wonder what exactly does music have to uh, to do with um, trench coats and luxury clothing? Well, uh, you know, maybe nothing directly, but music is a real touchstone for the people who they uh, identify as their main consumers, which is to say, millennials. And uh, wh- when you when you go to this page, what you find is a uh, a sort of a grid in which there are um, uh, uh, videos of a number of different uh, at this point tens if not hundreds of different um, uh, bands, English bands, uh, performing an acoustic song. The the web page is called Burberry Acoustic, and uh, whereas the site, the Burberry dot com site in general has a uh, average um, uh, time spent of approximately ten to twelve minutes, which itself is quite remarkable, uh, the Burberry Acoustic page has um, an average time spent of closer to seventeen or eighteen minutes. Uh, um, so that identity uh, that is done with uh you know uh with with uh, rock bands young uh, kind of rough hewn playing acoustic instruments uh very authentic something very natural about it carries over to the uh clothing itself and uh and also um you know works with the idea of craftsmanship that they are promoting in the rest of their marketing. Frank, thank you so much. I'm afraid we're just about out of time, but I know a few people that ask questions about presentation and about readings. As Frank said in his presentation, we will make sure to get you copies not only of this and the slides um, as a video for you to watch. We will also be including some of the readings that he's referenced. Uh, We'll make sure you have access to some of the case studies and some of the psychological research. So you can dig a little bit deeper into those and kind of uh, try it on for size yourself. Uh, Frank, thank you so much. If people want to reach out to you, are there any social media channels or anything they might be able to hit you up on? Do you use Twitter or any of those as well? Yes, of course. Uh, I'm uh, uh, at Frank Rose on Twitter, and I'm on uh, also on LinkedIn and uh, uh, Facebook. Uh, I have a, a Facebook page. It's um, uh, facebook.com forward slash Frank Rose. Uh, you're welcome to uh, join me there. And uh, I look forward forward to uh, hearing from uh, from anyone who's interested. All right. Frank, thank you so much. Uh, to the rest of you, have a great day, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Matt.